Hello, my friends. Brett Patterson coming at you from the financial capital of the West. Joined by the chairman, Brian hey. Unsaker. How you doing? I'm great. Good. It's been a great week in the market. Good two weeks. Did you know last week was the best week of the year for returns? Yeah, it's, it was. Uh, it was nice. Yeah. Yeah, and we're just kind of like just same old thing day in day out. Discipline in the way we approach it. But, is it, but it's fascinating that. Oh, sorry. It was. I bet you're going to say the same thing I am. Well, I was just going to say that. Yeah, last week was a good week, but uh, it's interesting. I, I read an article last week, I think it was, that if you missed like the top seven or eight days of 2023, you're actually down or on the year. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> another another reminder that you need to stay invested into great businesses. So prior to last week, fear was as great as it's been since last year. And then what happens on the back of fear? Great returns. Yeah. How great are returns? Well, this year, year to date, the S&P 500 is up 15.29%. The NASDAQ up 42.14%. We're approaching the year's highs, although the year high on the S&P was 20%. So off the high a little bit. One year return, so trading 12 months, which would be November to November, uh, the S&P 500, 17.85%, and the NASDAQ at 43.74%. So it's been a great year, great 12 months. But here's the thing, Brian. We had a, a, a good dude in, and he was he's a potential client. Yeah. And he, was, he had this simple question. I'm going to pose this question to you. Because that's what we need to talk about today on our podcast. Here's the, here's the statement that he made and the question. Brian, the world is messy. A lot of crap going on. Wars, rumors of wars. It's like a Bible verse. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate or we navigate a messy world in uncertainty in the way we manage portfolios? That's a great question, it's right? A, it's a great question. How do we navigate a messy world? Yeah. I've been through several messy worlds in financial markets. Because uh, you're really old. I'm really old. <laughs> <laughs> we don't I'm need to remind anybody of that. <laughs> I'm kidding. But no. But, uh, you know, 2020 the or, 20, or 2000, uh -huh. the dot-com kind of bubble burst uh went through that went through the financial crisis in 08 managing money at this time in fact i started iron gate by the way we just just had our 24th anniversary yeah. iron gate uh, 24 years iron gates been around we started in october 1st 1999 uh, october 1st 1999 so 24 years and uh i remember going through the 08 financial crisis and I mean, I, I own good businesses, and I've been managing money really the same process for the last 24 years. But as you, you know, you get a little experience and you think about, you have experiences that kind of uh, influence the way you do things. And I came out of the 08 financial crisis with, an, with the idea that I want to own businesses that are I don't want to say bulletproof, but uh, for lack of a better term, just are able to withstand tough and difficult economic environments. And in other words, I want to own great businesses. And I've always wanted to own great businesses, but I think in prior to that, I was really focused on probably more so on the valuation side. And buying cheap businesses. Buying good businesses, but... Um, I was really focused on the more the value side. Okay. You know, does it look traditionally cheap? And I think going through my, my experience going through the, the difficult times of 08, I I really had a little bit of a mind shift and more to the quality of owning a business. And it's interesting because I think about Buffett and his evolution and the way he managed money. When he started yeah. managing money, 
he was he learned from his professor at uh, at Columbia, Ben Graham. Yeah. And Ben Graham wrote the really the Bible on valuing or value you know value investing. He's really uh, regarded as the kind of the grandfather of value investing. Mm -hmm. If buying Buffett calls them cigar butts, buying you know really not good companies, but buying them so cheap that they're good investments. And then as he as Buffett uh, kind of went through his investment career, he and was introduced met Charlie Munger. He met Charlie Munger and he, Ken Fisher, not mm. Ken Fisher, but Ken Fisher's Phil, dad. Phil Fisher. Phil Fisher wrote a book called Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits. Yeah. And really, the whole idea in that book is buying great businesses that can compound and grow your wealth over time at fair, good at, to fair at prices. Fair prices, reasonable prices. Yes, yeah, reasonable. And, uh, yeah. And and that's that's Munger. That's also a Munger idea as well. And they had a big influence on Buffett and how he managed money is buying businesses, maybe paying a fair price as opposed to a, a deep discount price for a good business, but not a great business. So yeah. that you know that's a long uh, way to answer your question on you know how do we manage a messy world with you know and and. But give me give me an idea of what that means. You buy a great business. They're not bulletproof, but but they're as close to bulletproof as we can get in a mm -hmm. business. When the messiness of this world comes around. I don't help help me understand w how these great businesses navigate that messy world to the benefit of us the shareholders. Yeah, they they adjust, they they uh Like uh, do you have, give me an example. I mean uh Yeah, we uh, right now I'm thinking of for example uh Disney. Okay? Uh I think Disney's a great business and you know we can we can argue about that, but I think it has a lot of great business characteristics. For for one, their brand, the Disney brand, I think is super valuable. They're going they're they're going through a transition in their business where their linear TV, their their historical TV business, everybody's cutting the cord. Well, Disney's now shaping up their cost structure on that business to right size the cost to a declining business, although very profitable, it's declining, and they're also they got a little aggressive, you know, uh, after COVID, and a lot of businesses did. They overinvested, yeah. and so now they're right sizing the investment on streaming to match kind of the prospects, the growth and prospects. So they adjust on the run. They just don't, you know. These are we got smart managers. That's why it's so important. One of our one of our processes that we look at are four things that we look at is management. Is management smart? Are they working for the shareholders? Do they have history of creating shareholder value? Yeah. That's something, you know, Bob Iger at Disney, that's what he's doing. Now, it he says they got a lot of work to do yet, which they do. I agree. They have a lot of work to do, and it's kind of messy. Disney's messy right yeah. now. Yeah, it is. The world is messy right now, yeah. and they're adjusting. Our, Tim Cook, same thing. Uh, in fact, Google, let's go. Let's talk about Google. I remember uh, we, we invested in Google well, the first time I invested in Google was back in 2012 or in that neighborhood. And at the time, people were discounting Google's ability to transition from the desktop to the mobile phone. Because yeah. everybody was doing search on desktop and they just nobody was really sure how Google was going to navigate that transition. Well, they did it incredibly well and they have thrived by you know over the last uh several really the last decade so here's what nick murray who we love we've quoted on this podcast before here's what he says about about buying great businesses and having great ceos partner with us as we buy into their business he says rational management bob Iger, tim cook uh whose duty to the shareholders is fiduciary will simply stop as hard and fast as they humanly can, whatever activity is producing losses for that company. So here's an example, recent example. Nike, Whole Foods, Walmart. All of them had retail stores in San Francisco, Portland, these cities where it's a little messy. These stores were getting robbed all the time. Theft was out of control. Guess what rational managers do? when there's a loss on their books mm -hmm. 
oh, we got to close those stores. We're losing too much money there. Right. They close the stores. They do the rational thing in order to make money for the shareholders. That's what you're saying yeah. Bob Iger's doing right now. That's what Iger's doing. That's what Tim Cook, Tim Cook has done. That's what the management at Google, they've done uh, over the years. They, they make adjustments. They, they evaluate the situation. They're rational. They're smart uh, business people, and they, make, and they make smart decisions over time. So that's why management is such an important part of our, our four pillars of investing. Yeah. yeah, you think about the question, how do we navigate portfolios – in a messy world or in a changing world and just interest rates moving higher yeah um wars um political landscapes right all these different things why is a manager so important in our process how do you view the managers um the ceos the way that we invest compared to the uh, the, the rest of the industry yeah I don't think uh, the rest of the industry, our industry, really thinks about management too much. Uh, compared no, to, they don't. They don't think about it at all. It's really the our, our industry is most most uh, asset allocators. As, asset allocators yeah. are just doing doing just that is allocating assets to you know some sector here, sector there. There's not really any sort of rhyme or reason. There's no really strategy other than. Okay, let's own a little bit of utilities. Let's own some. We think this, so let's do that. Basic materials, yeah, they'll do that. Where we're looking at a an investment, like a business owner looks at an investment. We're going to look at management. Is management smart? Are they honest? Do you, do you want? Would you work? Would you want them working for you? Does the business have competitive advantages? You know, these are things that if you're going to buy a business, these are things you're going to look at. A, a, a rational, smart business person is going to look at. Is the business priced it appropriately? Is it overvalued, undervalued? You know, is this an attractive mm -hmm. price? These are you know, you're going to look at the industry, industry trends. You look, you're going to look forward and say, does this industry have a bright future? If it doesn't, then you know, why would you invest in that in that industry? Most. One of the advantages that we have because of our approach is Wall Street in general, if you turn on CNBC, it's it's all about now. Where Where's this stock going tomorrow? Where's it going over the next week, the next couple months? And they, for example, may look at, look at a stock and say, well, we don't really don't like this. Sentiment's, sentiment is negative on this particular company. We think it's going to go down over the next few months, so we're not going to own it. We're, we're looking at that company and saying, yeah, we agree that a lot of people are negative about this business right now, but we're looking out, say, five years from now, and we think this business, we might may think that this business is a good investment over the next five years and not so much concerned over the next three weeks or five weeks. Yeah. So the CEO of the business that we're buying is more or less our business partner. Absolutely, yeah. And part of the reason why we buy the stocks that we do, call them stocks, we like to refer to them as businesses, the businesses that we do is because we trust that in a messy world, Tim Cook, Andy Jassy, Bob Iger, Reed Hastings, although he's not the CEO anymore, yeah, um, those, those leaders are such good leaders that they'll navigate that landscape for us and not only navigate it, but make the necessary changes within their business to thrive. Right. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. Yeah. You think about it. I mean, when businesses, when business owners or business managers make decisions, it, it doesn't have, I mean, these things don't immediately show up today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, if Tim Cook makes a decision to do, you know, a certain strategy with the iPhone, you'll see the results of that decision maybe as early as six months at the earliest, probably six months down the road, but probably a year or two, you'll see the effects of that decision. Wall Street's focused on here and now. It doesn't have the patience to think about Tim Cook's making decisions that's going to benefit Apple over the next year or two. Wall Street is not looking that far. Yeah. That gives us an advantage as the, because of the way we manage money. It, w it was interesting. We were in a meeting, uh, Spencer and I, of a, of a very successful, wealthy client, 
And he was talking to us about, okay, I've got X amount of money. I think this is in public stocks, but I think I need a, a, a slug in private equity. And he asked us, well, how, what do you think about private equity? And my response was, okay, private equity, you've got these young, you know, go-getters that are trying to make it big in a new business. That's great. Would I put my money there? Not proven. Not proven businesses, a right? Lot of them, a Try, lot of just, them. I, I want to invest in a, a soon-to-be unicorn. Or managers. Yeah. Not proven managers or businesses. 100%. Yeah. Not proven, but a really cool idea idea and category to invest in. Yeah. Would I put my money there or would I put my money with a proven business leader, capital allocator like Tim Cook? Where's your money going to be safer? Yeah. In a private equity fund or whatever, I mean, call it any investment, or Tim Cook, the best CEO in the world. Like, where's your money safer? Well, and it's interesting because I, it's, it's, I think it's clearly safer in owning, you know, investing with Tim Cook along with Tim Cook, who's a proven manager. Apple may, as we've said many times on our podcast, may be the best business in the world. And, but what the the negative or most what people don't like is. It's the stock market. It's yeah. the daily price you get every single day that scares people. You know, Apple goes down t tomorrow for no reason. Like, you know, people get nervous about that. That's mm -hmm. where private equity, you don't get a price. In fact, you might be lucky once to a get quarter? a price once a quarter, maybe yeah. once a year. Yeah. And I'm not sure I, you know, do you believe that price? I mean, the, the biggest hope that we have for our clients and for anybody investing out there is that you view the stocks you own in your portfolio truly as businesses. And we're partnering with those CEOs and those businesses to manage our money in the right way for whatever changes come on the horizon in this messy world. I mean, that's if people just did that and changed the way they understood stocks to be businesses everyone would relax right i unless you buy crappy crappy businesses <laughs> yeah that's what you're talking about is just kind of a mindset the psychology of investing you we talked about this today yeah. with this customer we're talking potential customer how important it is to have a certain mindset to, so you can ha so you can be successful as an investor a lot of investors just they might they're, they're smart people but they think about investing or owning a business or owning a stock which we don't like the term stock would much rather you use the term business because yeah. stock represents a piece of paper squiggly line on a computer screen that goes up and goes down for no reason a, but if people could just change their mindset and, and know or think about, yeah, I own a business, and yes, the stock market go the stock market goes up and down. I get a price every day, and it goes up and goes goes down. I really should ignore that. You know, maybe what you pay attention to is once a year, once a quarter. You can look at your portfolio, but don't really pay attention to the day to day ups and downs, and movements in the market. It's not helpful. It actually is probably detrimental to good investment success, long term success. Yeah. And, and think, you know, we keep saying this, think long term. Do you want to own Apple or, or uh, Netflix or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever business it is? Is this a business you want to own over the next five years? If it's not, then you shouldn't own it for five days. If you don't feel good about owning Apple for five years, then you shouldn't own it at all. Amen, brother. That's how we navigate a messy world is we hire the smartest people in the world to with, navigate it with us and run the great best businesses in the world yep. yeah yep that's how you do it my friends okay that was good that was good way to go b good job all right <laughs> until next time my friends bye now